Hello, this is Vivian Chu. I will be talking about infective endocarditis. This is the module on clinical manifestations and diagnosis. The learning objectives of this module are to review the signs and symptoms of infective endocarditis, to understand the causes of the clinical manifestations of infective endocarditis, and finally, to examine the tools used to diagnose infective endocarditis and specifically to review the Duke criteria. The clinical manifestations of infective endocarditis are due to four main processes. First, the infectious process on the heart valves, including local mechanical complications. Second, embolization to other organs. Third, persistent bacteremia with seeding of other organs. And fourth, immune-mediated processes including circulating immune complexes. The symptoms of infective endocarditis, that is the subjective complaints of patients, are highly variable and nonspecific. Fever occurs in most patients with infective endocarditis, although it can be absent in those who are elderly, have congestive heart failure, or who have received antibiotic therapy already. Other nonspecific constitutional symptoms, such as anorexia, weight loss, malaise, myalgias, and arthralgias, are also common, particularly in subacute infective endocarditis. The signs of infective endocarditis, that is, the findings that a clinician would see on physical exam, reflect the four processes that were discussed in the first slide. Fever, along with a new or changing heart murmur, and signs of embolic phenomena, the first three signs listed here are the hallmark signs of infective endocarditis. Splenomegaly occurs in about one in 10 patients. Cutaneous findings include splinter hemorrhages, Janeway lesions, and Osler nose. Bot spots can be found on the retina, and conjunctival hemorrhages can be found on the conjunctiva. These peripheral manifestations are less commonly seen. In the next few slides, we will see some examples of the signs of infective endocarditis listed here. Embolic phenomena, which occur when a piece of the vegetation breaks off, travels in the bloodstream, and lodges in an organ, can occur in any organ. The most not noteworthy are pulmonary emboli, which occur in the lungs, pictured here, cerebral emboli, which cause embolic strokes and hemorrhages, renal emboli, which can cause kidney dysfunction, and peripheral emboli, which can manifest on fingers and toes, also pictured here. Immunologic phenomena occur in infective endocarditis because infective endocarditis causes stimulation of humoral and cellular immunity. This can lead to immune complex deposition in areas such as the retina, termed, termed Roth spots, pictured here, kidneys, termed glomerulonephritis, and in the periphery, called Osler nodes. Looking at infective endocarditis from the perspective of different organ systems, cardiac complications are common in infective endocarditis. Heart failure is a major complication of infective endocarditis and occurs in at least one third of patients. This can be due to perforation of the valve leaflet, rupture of the chordae tendini or papillary muscle, or simply damage enough to cause moderate to severe valvular regurgitation. Cardiac abscesses, either paravalvular or myocardial, can lead to conduction disturbances, such as heart block. Pictured here is an EKG tracing, demonstrating altered cardiac conduction. Neurologic complications are also common among patients with infective endocarditis. Stroke occurs in 15 to 20 percent of patients and can be hemorrhagic in some cases. Stroke is often a presenting symptom of infective endocarditis. Mycotic aneurysms are infected areas of arterial dilation that can occur in the cerebral vessels and are usually silent until rupture occurs. Brain abscess and meningitis are less common neurologic complications of infective endocarditis. Pictured here is imaging of the brain that demonstrates a ring-enhancing lesion due to an abscess resulting from an infected embolus in infective endocarditis. 
Renal disease occurs through one of three mechanisms. Immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis, septic emboli to the kidney, abscess, and finally, drug-induced interstitial nephritis, which can be caused by the antibiotics that are used to treat infective endocarditis, in particular, beta-lactams. Pictured here is an abdominal CT scan showing left kidney infarction caused by infective endocarditis. The mainstays of the diagnosis of infective endocarditis are clinical suspicion based on a careful history and physical exam, blood cultures, and imaging via echocardiography. Blood cultures are an extremely important diagnostic test to identify the infecting organism in infective endocarditis. As illustrated in this graph, it is important to obtain a high enough volume of blood to be able to recover bacterial organisms. Most of the major causes of infective endocarditis, such as staph and strep, can be identified in blood cultures. Nevertheless, there are some organisms that are difficult to grow in culture, and we use other methods, such as serologies, to identify these pathogens. Common serologic tests for infective endocarditis are shown in the table. Pathogens such as Coxiella, Bartonella, and Brucella are usually identified by serology. Imaging, by use of echocardiography, allows us to detect signs of infective endocarditis such as vegetations, seen as an oscillating mass, abscess, valve dehiscence, or new valvular regurgitation. Pictured here is an echocardiogram demonstrating an aortic valve vegetation. There are two main types of echocardiography that are used for the diagnosis of infective endocarditis, transthoracic echocardiography and transesophageal echocardiography. Transthoracic echocardiography is non-invasive. However, it is less sensitive for detecting vegetations, abscesses, and other complications of infective endocarditis. Transesophageal echocardiography is more invasive because a probe is inserted into the, into the esophagus and the heart is viewed from behind. However, transesophageal echocardiography is more sensitive for detecting the signs of infective endocarditis. It is recommended in specific clinical scenarios as described in the box. Transesophageal echocardiography is recommended when transthoracic images are inadequate or when the patient has a prosthetic valve or intracardiac device such as a pacemaker or if the patient is at high risk or there is a high clinical suspicion for complications of infective endocarditis as in the case of staph aureus etiology, new heart block, or poor response to antimicrobials. These are fairly detailed concepts regarding echocardiography imaging. You need to know that transesophageal echocardiography is generally a more sensitive tool for diagnosing infective endocarditis than transthoracic echocardiography. The tools that we use for the diagnosis of infective endocarditis are summed up in the modified Duke criteria. Using major and minor criteria, we can classify the diagnosis of infective endocarditis into definite, possible, and rejected. The major and minor Duke criteria are listed here. Major criteria consist of blood cultures positive for microorganisms that are consistent with infective endocarditis as well as evidence of endocardial involvement, mostly by echocardiography. The minor criteria include the predisposition to infective endocarditis, such as a predisposing heart condition or injection drug use, fever, vascular phenomena, and immunologic phenomena. Take a few minutes to review the Duke criteria in detail.